All right, so what I'm going to do today is sort of give you a little bit of background on the history of GPUs, what is special about their architecture, and take up one particular example, namely matrix multiplication, in order to sort of show how some of the principles that we have talked about in the course, right, come into play when you are taking up a very specific instance of a problem <clears throat> and trying to map it onto a given architecture, right? So in some sense, it sort of wraps up the course. We have a problem with this, uh, the algorithm, with the matrix multiplication, and we have an architecture, which is the GPU. And what is of interest to us is how do we sort of go about mapping one, uh, the algorithm to the architecture, okay? So let's proceed with this in mind. So the problem domain that we are interested in, right, uh, is image processing. And image processing largely consists of manipulation of pixels, right? Essentially what we have, what we can think of is an image is typically seen as a two-dimensional rectangle, right? And within this rectangle, I might have some shapes, okay? And what is the kind of processing that we are in, uh, interested in as far as is concerned, we might want to take these shapes, which actually correspond to the projections of some pictures from a multi-dimensional space, probably three-dimensional, right, into a two-dimensional space. And the kinds of uh, transformations, right, or uh, modifications to the image that we are interested in are multiple, right? It could be sort of moving these objects around and recreating what the image looks like, right? Supposing what happens if this goes here and this one moves here, right? We could also have something which basically involves rotating one of the objects, right? Of course, if I rotate a circle, nothing much happens to it. Or I could have something else which basically says, I will shear the object, right? What does shearing mean? It means sort of stretching this out, right? In which case the triangle becomes no longer equilateral, the circle becomes an ellipse and so on, right? Now, the interesting thing is all of these transformations, if I take my image to be essentially a coordinate system, right, x comma y, and I have a point over here, which is p of x comma y, what we can say is this gets mapped onto some p prime, right? And this transformation essentially is some kind of a matrix multiplication in general, right? Matrix multiplication can be used in order to model rotation, shearing, uh, even translation. Well, it would be a multiplication plus something else, right? So it essentially an additive offset to uh, one of the coordinates x or y or both. Right? So various kinds of things, right? in other words, matrix manipulation right, can be used in order to model pretty much all the problems that we come across in image processing. Right? Now, of course, what I've shown over here is the case where I have a three-dimensional scene which is being mapped onto a two-dimensional surface, right? the image to be displayed. I could also have something else where you know I actually have, I'm trying to visualize something which is more than a three-dimensional picture or there is movement or there is something else and all of those then need to get mapped onto either a three-dimensional space or a two-dimensional space and finally displayed on a screen, okay? The bottom line is the most important observation here is that all of this comes down to some kind of matrix operations, okay? So this is a sort of, you know, a brief review of graphics processing units over the years. In particular, these are NVIDIA. Right, so I'm just focusing on the company NVIDIA in particular. The other major sort of competitor to NVIDIA over the years was for the longest time a company called ATI, which was then taken over by AMD, right? And Intel, of course, has also had their own graphics chips or graphics subsystems within their processors, right? Now, for the last 20 years or so, NVIDIA has always been consistently at the top and over the last 10 years or so, they have pretty much taken a big lead over the others, right? And uh, primarily, it comes about because of a transformation that they sort of caught onto very well about 15 years ago, right? But okay, just to go back to the starting, the sort of first discrete graphics card, something that could be plugged into your PC in order to get you better performance, uh, there were card, graphics cards, you know, uh, 
for quite a long time but around 1995 the nvidia nv1 was a big jump it essentially allowed certain kinds of new graphics right animated graphics animated games in order to you know animated games to come into existence the processor itself was capable of essentially 1 million operations per second and by today standards it was tiny right 1 million transistors okay now you can see the evolution 1999 they are already gone up by a huge factor nearly 500x right 400 million operations per second the number of transistors hasn't gone up correspondingly which means that they've clearly found a better way to sort of allocate their transistors to computation or as sometimes happens in these cases the other thing that happens is you know you sort of change the definition of an operation right but so that operations per second is still not very clear right typically at this point what we are talking about is something like pixel operations right so what is a pixel op it is essentially some kind of a simple matrix multiplication but then what how is the pixel represented is it in uh, you know uh, how many bit fixed point or is it floating point typically not floating point there would be some kind of 8 bit fixed point or something of that sort right and because of that the way you count operations sort of was not uh, you know uh, standardized at that point now you can see that you know moore's law or something similar was clearly in existence as far as graphics processing units were concerned we had hit like 12 gigaops by 2004 but 2006 saw a sort of shift in the way people looked at these processing units right because by this time they had reached the point where they said look most of the image processing that needs to be done the kind of matrix manipulation that needs to be done over here is such that we actually need to start looking at floating point operations so what was ending up happening was that most of these uh, gpus were actually doing floating point computation because you needed that kind of dynamic range of the numbers okay floating point basically wins as far as dynamic range is concerned not so much for the uh, precision with which it can represent the numbers right so that uh, dynamic range uh, that came about over there people realize okay if we need to do floating point anyway why restrict ourselves to only doing image processing is there any way by which we can now start to use the computations these matrix operations that are there inside gpus to do something else other than just image manipulation and for a long time the, there was an interesting direction of research which basically said how do i take some other problem let's say you know finding something like shortest paths in a graph or even a database search and cast it as a image pipeline okay what i mean by an image pipeline is something a sequence of matrix manipulations right matrix computations which would give me the same result right so this is an interesting way of looking at the problem rather than saying i will build my architecture to solve a problem now you are saying the opposite you are saying i have a architecture which is capable of doing some kinds of computations fast let me modify my algorithm to fit that okay so in general this is an interesting view point from this you know when you look at the whole course itself right it's not always the question that you just take your algorithm and you try to find out what's the best architecture for it sometimes you might be in a situation where you have something which looks like a good architecture right and what you want to do is to now see okay how do i pose my problem in such a way that it can be handled by this architect that's pretty much what happened in the sort of 2006 to 2010 that time frame right and of course the gpus continued growing in complexity by 2008 they had hit almost 1 teraflops right so this is a single chip that is capable of doing 1 teraflops of computation right even now the processors don't hit that kind of performance okay now that continued increasing rapidly and in another 8 years it hit 10 teraflops on a single chip pretty much right but look at the size of the chip 15 billion transistors and the ga100 right the ampere series from nvidia which released just this year is capable of you know doing 20 teraflops but that's not the main thing the 20 teraflops is actually now they have sort of adapted even one step further what they said is okay fine a lot of scientific computations require floating point but what's the biggest sort of you know uh, buzzword of the day neural networks let's build 
hardware that is really good at doing that, right? So this is essentially some kind of tensor operations, right? And of course, when I say this, this T stands for tera, right? So we are talking about 300 tera, 300 into 10 to the power of 12 tensor operations per second, okay? Now, what is a tensor operation? That's essentially, it could be, you know, that's part of the problem, right? Floating point operations is relatively well defined. But tensor operations, people are still not very clear what exactly it is. I mean, it could be like addition of two uh, uh, components of a tensor, right? A tensor is essentially a multidimensional matrix. It could be like addition, it could be something else, it could be, you know, comparison, it could be sort of uh, the clipping operations, all of those sort of are broadly classified as tensor operations. But whichever way you look at it, there is no doubt that the number of operations per second that a single chip can do today is phenomenal. Okay. Now, how did this happen? In order to understand that, we also want to look a little bit at the structure of a CPU. Right. So this is broadly what a processor looks like. Right. Essentially, what we have is what is the sort of most basic core component of a processor? There is an arithmetic and logic unit. There is a register file that's used in order to store the data to be computed, which is you know usually almost considered a part of the ALU. And then there is memory, right? This memory is the tricky part. It has to reside outside the CPU because the memory requirements, first of all, depend on the type of application that you are trying to run. And in general, the memory requirements are going to be pretty large, okay? At the same time, what happens, the larger the memory, you, in order to get high density of memory, you need to go towards technology like DRAM. What's the problem with DRAM? It is slow. Slow in the sense that the latency is high. Okay, DRAM can typically have very high bandwidth. In other words, you can access a large number of bits per second. The problem is accessing the first one of those bits, right? Uh, getting to the point where you can start reading out the data typically requires some kind of complicated setup procedure, right? You need to do activate some rows in the corresponding bank of memory. After that, you need to do a column access probe. You then need to get the data and in between you need to be refreshing those uh, uh, DRAM banks. All those mean that the latency of access in DRAM is typically high, which is why we come up with this whole idea of using cache memory. What does cache memory do? It essentially brings in the idea that, okay, the DRAM can be big but slow, whereas the cache memory will be small but fast, right? Of course, unfortunately, this image gives exactly the opposite picture. It looks as though the DRAM is small, but that's not the point. Over here, the DRAM is actually usually sitting outside the CPU, right? And the whole point of DRAM is that it has to be large in capacity. Whereas the cache will be small. Okay. So this picture over here already shows you a situation where you have multiple processors, right? Multi core. But now what happens when you have multi core is that now there are four ALUs, let's say, in, uh, according to this picture, right? Any one of them might be doing a certain computation, and those computations are in principle completely independent of each other. Okay. So what happens when they all try to access the different parts of memory at the same time, right? Which one gets priority? Which one gets access to the cache? What happens when you essentially have a multi-master system on a bus over here, right? So the bus has to sort of handle priorities. How do I allocate uh, the bus to each and every one of these so that they all get access? At the same time, you know, I make sure that none of them are kept idling for too long. Uh, you know, various considerations come into the picture. Similarly, as far as the cache is concerned, what happens if two of them are trying to access the same area of memory, right? Or if the area of memory that two processors are trying to access comes into the same part of the cache, right? How do I handle all of these situations? All this means that the control region that you have over here, right, starts to become more complicated. The other thing that happened was, once people started hitting the sort of ceiling, of Moore's law uh, of performance as far as Moore's law is concerned, right? Primarily in the form that the frequency of operation could not be increased any further, right? So why did that happen? 
until around like 2000 2000 up to around 2005 or so the big uh, race was to see who can run faster and faster right so you ended up having processors right it was a race to get to 1 gigahertz then 2 gigahertz 3 gigahertz they got up to that point and then suddenly they started backing off so for a long time in between the processors were running slower than they were in 2005 right and the simple reason was that when you get to those kind of speeds the power consumption is just going out of hand right not only is the high frequency causing power but it means that you also need to run at a fairly high voltage to get that kind of high frequency which has secondary effects on uh, the uh, heating of the system it has a uh, effect on the total power consumption it also has an effect on the leakage right and all of those things started coming which meant that people started looking at multi core right how do i use more and more cores in the system in order to get the same performance not just that the next thing that needed to happen was even within a single core what are the things that i can do can i sort of try and find parallelism in the way that things are executing right can i sort of start doing operations out of order can i speculate meaning that you know if i come to a branch i speculate and say that you know this is the version of the branch that's going to be taken and i will continue uh, you know operating right so similarly branch prediction right the other speculative execution sort of goes a little bit beyond that it can also sort of it's not just about branch prediction it also sort of says okay if there are multiple operations that are happening can i run them in parallel what happens if there is a conflict things of that sort also come into the picture right problem with all of this is that although it did improve the performance meaning that you were able to squeeze out a little bit more in terms of how many instructions per second could be executed this control portion ended up being a very large part of the cpu okay and this control if you look at it is in it's sort of what you would call random logic right and what i mean by random logic is not that you know it's unpredictable or anything like that it means that it does not have a clean repetitive structure right cache memory is not random logic it is very 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 regular right it has the same that cache memory cell being repeated thousands of times an alu is not that regular but it is fairly regular example if i have like adders then you know there are basically like 32 or 64 full adder cells all in a block right the register file is also a regular structure the control logic on the other hand is irregular right each and every one of these the out of order execution the branch prediction all of those have different requirements and what ends up happening is you have this large mess of control which occupies a large part of the cpu correspondingly consumes a reasonable uh, fraction of the power and becomes harder and harder to sort of manage as you go along okay so this is where we are with multi core so these were typically what were called the multi core systems right we would have like maybe two cores four cores they went all the way up to some eight cores or so it becomes really hard to sort of manage the question that then came up was how do i jump beyond that what's restricting me in terms of the number of cores that i can have right can i really go to something like hundreds of cores and if so how do i manage it and that was sort of the insight that nvidia was and it was not that it was completely new there were people who were talking about this but they were able to make good use of it what was the approach they followed they essentially said these green parts would be alus and this small yellow parts would be the control logic corresponding to a group of alus right so in other words all of these together have one control so what happens over there is by having that one control unit you are in some ways forcing the system you are sort of saying all the alus have to perform the same operation at a given clock cycle okay this was sort of called single instruction multiple data right so um, an extension of this basically became single instruction multiple thread right this was the name that they used for it right essentially what they said is there will be multiple threads of core that are running right and at any given point in time all the threads the only requirement is that they are essentially executing the same instruction on different units of data okay so somehow i need to 
increase the bandwidth or increase the amount of data that I can pull from main memory into these processors. But if I can do that, I can have all of these processors independently working on a separate unit of the data. Okay. Not just that, they threw out all of these ideas like branch prediction, speculative execution, all of that is gone. Right? They just said, okay, let's not bother with all of that. Let's keep the entire silicon area just for the computation alone. Okay? So what happens in such a situation? It means that now suddenly a very large part of your silicon area is devoted purely to computation, the ALUs. Okay? What about cache memory? Yes, you still require cache memory, but because of the regular nature of the memory accesses that you are enforcing, right? So the programming model enforces uniform data access. Right? Now, this is obviously a constraint. Right? The whole idea of the original CPUs was that you can write any kind of program and they would still be able to run it fast. The GPU finally sort of gave up on that and said, look, I'm not going to try and solve all the problems of the world. Let me look at specifically if I have highly data parallel computation, how can I get a better architecture for that? Okay, So the evolution which started out by saying that, oh, look, I have this GPU which is capable of doing certain kinds of computation. Let me try and write my algorithms for that. Finally, they switched it back and said, okay, look, I mean, these are the kinds of applications that really have huge matrix computation requirements. Let me now tailor my GPU so that it can do those better. Of course, it turned out to be a good thing that having better matrix computations was also good for graphics, right? So they could continue selling it for the graphics cards also. But interestingly, by this point, what ended up happening was NVIDIA was now able to sell the same chips, but with different tweaks, primarily in terms of you know the uh, amount of uh, resilience it has to uh, memory errors and uh, other properties like double precision floating point. Almost the same chips could be now sold in three categories. One was the gaming uh, GPUs, right? The lowest cost of the lot, but also you know they don't have error correcting memory. They typically did not have double precision floating point. But they still had all this, you know, parallel cores and all the, the other, the programming model was still there. Slightly more expensive, add the error correcting code and maybe some degree of double precision, but not so much, right? And you have a workstation class, which is very good for CAD type of applications. And finally, you have the really high end scientific computing, okay? The, what they called, I think, the Fermi class at that time, okay? And this is more or less where GPUs are now. Now they have gone one step further, right? It's not just floating point operations. They also are capable of executing half precision floating point, integer operations, and the tensor operations in general, okay? So obviously in order to make use of this, you need to change your programming model. The code must understand the constraints supplied by the architecture. Okay, so this is in terms of, you know, mapping an algorithm to an architecture. This is a situation where rather than trying to find the best architecture for a problem, you are saying that I have an architecture and now I need to understand its constraints and adapt my code or adapt my algorithm to do well on it.